All right, thank you for the singing tonight. Take your Bible, please. Turn to Acts chapter 20, and we're going to read a few verses here. As now we enter into the final chapters of Acts, as Paul is going to be leaving Ephesus and finish up the second missionary journey, and then before, the last thing he'll really do on the missionary journey is at the end of Acts 20, he'll, he travels around. We're going to see his travels around once he leaves Ephesus. And then he speaks to the elders of Miletus. And then in chapter 21, he goes to Jerusalem. And then he's arrested. And so from Acts 21 to the end of the book, he's under arrest. So this chapter kind of begins, if you will, a new section of final chapters of the book of Acts, where Paul will be arrested and all of the legal battles with government ensue. So Acts 20 documents, and our message tonight is on the care of the churches. And before I read the text, I want to kind of just show you what we're going to read, because it's very interesting if you look on a map, if you get your map out. So what we're going to read is this. Paul is going to be in Ephesus when we begin, and he's going to leave Ephesus, he'll go up to Troas, or go across Troas up into Macedonia, go through Philippi, Thessalonica, those Macedonian cities, come down to Corinth, spend about three months here, and then he wants to take a ship across and go to Syria, but he's not able to, we'll read why, but instead he goes back through Macedonia and goes back to Troas and comes down to Miletus where he speaks to the elders of the church. So that's what we're going to read. So this, these few verses are going to take almost a year. And he's going to travel these hundreds of miles in these few verses that we're going to read in Acts chapter 20. And I'll start in verse 1. And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him his, the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece. And there abode three months, and when the Jews laid wait for him, as he was about to sail into Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia. And there accompanied him into Asia, Sopater of Berea, and of the Thessalon Thessalonians, Aristarchus, and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby, and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus, and Trophimus. These going before tarried for us at Troas. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. And, and that's the Passover. So that would be the celebration, if you will, of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And came unto them in Troas, to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus. Stay out of the window tonight. Good thing our windows don't open, though. That would be a long fall down. Being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. Now, whose fault was it that he fell asleep? Was it Paul's long sermon? <laughs> Or was it Eutychus' lack of attention? <laughs> or somewhere in the middle. And Paul went down and fell on him, and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When therefore, when he therefore was come up again, and had broken bread and eaten, and talked a long while, he preached till midnight and kept on preaching till break of day. So he departed. And they, how long was that sermon? He was sucking wind, I bet you, huh? <laughs> and they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. And we went before the ship. And, and the details here are so amazing. These little fine details. We went before the ship. We, that's Luke, and sailed unto Asos, there intending to take in Paul. For so had he appointed, minding himself to go afoot. Now, isn't that interesting? They took a ship, Paul walked. 
These details are amazing. That shows you that Luke is an eyewitness to these events. And when he met with us at ASOS, we took him in and came to Mytilene. And we sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Trogelium. And the next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. For he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Okay, let's pray. So, Father, thank you, Lord, as we enter into these final chapters in this powerful book of the proclamation of the gospel. We thank you for the Apostle Paul who continues to preach the gospel. And, Lord, we pray that you would uh, encourage us tonight as we see Paul's love for the church, Paul's care for all these churches that he started and how we're going to see there was a lot of things on his mind behind the words that we just read. So help us, Lord, to see, see a little bit of what was on Paul's heart as the uproar ceased in Ephesus and as he moves on from there and finishing up his journey. We pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. So after this big uproar and riot, it says after the riot that was in, there in, in Ephesus, after it ceased. So Paul didn't desert them. He was like a captain of a ship. You know, a captain of a ship does not desert the ship when it's going down. He's the last one in, last one off. So Paul did not desert the believers in Ephesus in the middle of the riot. He waited for it to calm down. And then it says, Paul called to his disciples and embraced them and departed from there. So behind everything that's going on in, these passage, in this passage, what I really want us to see tonight is a verse of scripture in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, where Paul talks about, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. I want us to see the care and love that Paul has for the church of Jesus Christ in this passage of scripture. And how he bore the burden. He was bearing, as he was traveling in these verses, we're going to see in practical ways. He was bearing the burden of the church in Rome, although he had not been there. He was bearing the, the burden of what was going on in Corinth. He was bearing the burden of, of, of the churches that he had started in Macedonia. And so Paul had great love and care for the church and he's such an incredible example so there's a number of things that Paul is doing in these verses I want us to focus on now the first point I want to take a little extra time I uh, did a little bit of study and it was pretty interesting to see what books of the Bible were written during this period of time at least three books of the Bible were written in these verses that we just read tonight you say well it didn't say it anywhere well, that's where we can go to other verses and see what led Paul to write some of these books. And we can say Paul wrote certain books during this period of time. So Paul was writing the word of God, at least three of them, which shows his deep care and concern for the spiritual growth of the churches. So while Paul was in Ephesus throughout Acts chapter 19, would also, it doesn't say in the text of Acts 19, but I'm going to show you, it does say it elsewhere, is that Paul visits Corinth. He makes a short visit to Corinth. Why did he do that? Well, go back to Acts 19, and it says in verse number 21 that as the word of God was prevailing, in verse 21 it says, Paul purposed in his spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I had been there, I must also see Rome. So he just wanted to there go Macedonia and Achaia. That's northern Greece. He doesn't say anything about Corinth. But then it says, so he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. So Paul sends Timothy into that region and it does seem though that Timothy actually after he visited around in Macedonia and again let me let me show you the map after Timothy 
spent some time in Macedonia, and remember, that's in northern Greece, that he must have come down here to Corinth. Because problems are brewing in Corinth. Opponents of the Apostle Paul have come into Corinth and were questioning and denying the apostleship of, of Paul. They were saying Paul was not an apostle. They were attacking Paul. And there were other problems in the church. So in response to this, Paul decides to visit Corinth immediately. Now, if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we're going to look at some of these verses because it is interesting when you look at some of these epistles at some of these little verses that we don't pay a whole lot of attention to. It does give you a sense of, of Paul's travels behind the scenes that are taking place in Acts. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 1, here it says, But I term, determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you. And he's writing to the Corinthians. He says that I would not come again to you in heaviness. So I believe that when he says come again to you, that he's referring to this short visit that he makes to Corinth when he's in Ephesus because he hears people are attacking his, his apostleship. They were coming in, they were preaching in 2 Corinthians 11, they were preaching another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel, and the church was putting up with false doctrine and attacking Paul and questioning whether he was an apostle or not. And so Paul had heaviness and he visited them and with, with this heavy heart, with sorrow, questioning who he was. And so Paul is planning to go to Corinth again, but he doesn't want to come to them with heaviness and with sorrow. So then what he does, it seems, now I'm going to piece some things together, and I can't be like a thousand percent sure about every detail of how I'm piecing this. And, and let me just say it this way. Paul wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians. It's in the Bible. We know for sure, go to 1st Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. 1st Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Go there. We know for sure he wrote at least one other book to the Corinthians. And that the verse that you're turning to is going to show that. And I'm going to have uh, uh, Bailey, could you read that in just a moment? Now, and let me say also, some say he wrote four books to the Corinthians. That could be, it could be. I'm just going to stick with three because it will take longer to try to explain if he wrote four. <laughs> so, so, but it could be he wrote four, but I'm just going to say at three, at least three. So after he makes this visit to Corinth, he writes them a letter. And some have called this letter a severe letter. And he makes reference to it in 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. And Bailey, could you read that verse for us? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Okay, so he's, now he's writing 1 Corinthians to them. And he's saying, I wrote to you in an epistle. <laughs> so he wrote to him a letter before he wrote 1 Corinthians. So, and you say, well, why isn't it in the Bible? Because God didn't want it in the Bible. It's non-canonical. It was a book that Paul wrote, but God did not deem it inspired, and that's God's choice and wisdom. So, so he wrote this letter. Some call it like a severe letter. He sent it. It seems he sent it by Titus. And now, as Paul is now in Ephesus, okay, so you're with me, right? He was in Ephesus, and he hears that things are, he has problems in Corinth. So he visits them there. They're denying his apostleship, false gospel. He goes there, comes back. The issue's not solved. He writes him a letter, some kind of a severe letter. And so things, things are still not solved. So now he's planning to go back there a third time. He's planning a third visit to them. So go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Look there, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And verse uh, 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and verse 1 and 2. And um, who has that for us? Ellie, could you please read that for us? 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. This will be the third time I am coming to you. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be 
I like to go is to have saved before and to all the rest that if I come again, I will not spare. Okay, so now Paul said the third time I'm coming to you. We know from the text in Acts 18, he was in Corinth for a year and a half. That's when he started the church. Then he left. The book of Acts does not tell us that he went back. But I just showed you that he made us a short and painful visit. A painful visit. That wasn't the first time he went. That was a time when he went to start the church. He went back because of issues that were causing heaviness on his heart. And he called it a sorrowful time, a sorrowful visit. And now he says, I'm going to come back the third time. Okay? So now, what does he do? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. He's going to go back the third time. And 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And verse number 1 and 2. And Raul, can I ask you to read those verses, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so you do. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered you, that there be no batteries in my hands. Okay, so Paul, and we'll talk about this uh, in a moment, but Paul has been raising support and funds, a special offering for the poor saints in Jerusalem. And he's instructing them, when you gather together on the first day of the week, take your offering, and then for the poor saints, lay that one off to the side, put it in store, put it in the bank, if you will. You know, and so that when I come, you don't have to have any special gatherings. You don't have to have any special services to raise more money for the, church of, uh, for the, the poor saints in Jerusalem. You'll already have the money there. That's what he's saying there. So he's saying, I'm going to come to the Corinthians. I'm going to come. The third time, 2 Corinthians. So now look at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And notice what it says here in verse 19. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 19. What does it say? The churches in Asia salute you. Where was Ephesus? That was in Asia. So Paul is writing 1 Corinthians from Asia. Where Ephesus is. He's writing 1 Corinthians, preparing to visit the Corinthians. And so when we go to Acts 20, where do we find Paul? In Asia. And what is Paul about to do? Visit Corinth. So therefore, that's why we say, if you go back to Acts chapter 20 and verse number 1, after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto them his disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. Just before that happened, he wrote 1 Corinthians. Because he also wrote, he wrote 1 Corinthians from Asia, from Ephesus, and he wrote it after the riot, because he talked about that verse about the beasts in Ephesus. So I believe it had to be after the riot, but before he left Ephesus. He wrote the book of Corinthians at the end, toward the end of his third missionary journey, toward the end of his ministry in Ephesus. Okay, so just to summarize everything that I just kind of went over, just quickly, just to summarize that, after his painful visit, Paul wrote this non-canonical book to Corinth, often called the severe letter. And then he, Paul, Paul wrote, and around AD 55 from Ephesus, he wrote the book of 1 Corinthians. So, so he's writing books here when he's in Ephesus. He wrote this painful letter. He wrote 1 Corinthians. Then as we follow through, and here's the verse in 1 Corinthians 15, after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. So he had to have written 1 Corinthians uh, after, right after that riot, but before he left Ephesus. So now Paul has left Ephesus and he's going to go up to Troas. So if you look in Acts chapter 20, it says, 
he embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. Now, it doesn't say that he took this journey, but if you look at any map of Paul's missionary journeys, it always has him leaving Ephesus, not taking a boat across the sea, but coming up to Troas. Now, why is that? Why do we know Paul went to Troas? Because if you look in 2 Corinthians, go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 12 and 13. For 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. And so Paul has just wrote, written to them about this second visit that he made with heaviness. And I believe in this passage he's also referring to the man who was committing immorality with his stepmother, but he repented. And so Paul is actually rejoicing that when they receive the book of 1 Corinthians, that this one who was doing that wicked, immoral sin had repented. So Paul is, is rejoicing in this and now is telling the church of Corinth to forgive that one and, and not to give Satan an advantage by having unforgiveness in your heart. That's verse 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now look at verse 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas... To preach Christ's gospel. And a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Is it warm in here? I'm right in the middle of the verse and I have to ask that question. Is it warm? You guys okay? If you need to turn that air conditioner on, go ahead. But watch this now. I had no rest in my spirit. So he came to Troas. He was there to preach. He leaves Ephesus. Goes up to Troas. He says there was an open door. There was a tremendous opportunity to preach the word of God. But I had no rest in my spirit. Why? Why didn't he have rest in his spirit? Because I found not Titus, my brother. Well, what, is, what difference does that make? Okay? What difference does that make, Paul? But taking my leave of them, I went from, I went from thence into Macedonia. So Paul was in Troas. This is where you got to have a map. you got to see what's going on. Going down here. He was here. But he's looking for Titus. Titus isn't here. I, I, I've got care. He's got the care of the churches on him. He can't have rest. He can't have peace. And because Titus isn't there. And so I gotta go, I gotta leave. Where are you going? I'm going to Macedonia. I'll get in a ship. He gets in a ship and goes to Macedonia. Now look in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Why did he what? Why did he, what was he worried about? Why didn't he have rest in his spirit? Why did he have to see Titus? What did Titus know that he had to find out? And here it is. I'll tell you and then we'll read the scripture. Titus had delivered to the Corinthians the book of 1 Corinthians. And Paul now wants to know what is their response? How do they respond? Will they repent? Will they accept his apostleship? Will they repent of their immorality and all of the other problems? And 1 Corinthians, the book about church problems. So he was very concerned about how they would take it. So he didn't have rest in his spirit. He had to hear from Titus. How is it going in Corinth? So that's what's going on as Paul's traveling, the care of the churches. So look in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And Charlie preached on this a few weeks ago and made reference to some of these things. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7... And verse 5, look what he says. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. Why? He hadn't found Titus yet. But we were troubled on every side, with outward fightings, with inward fears. About what? The care of the church and their response to, his, to the word of God. Paul was afraid that the church of Corinth, upon receiving his inspired letter, would not repent. And there were fears, there were fightings. Verse 6, nevertheless God, that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. So Titus said, yes, 
the Corinthians have repented. And that was Charlie's message a few weeks ago. And so Paul was relieved about this. So why, did him, why couldn't Paul stay in Troas? He was burdened with fear and, yeah, care of the church of Corinth. And he had to find out. To, so he went to Macedonia, and that's where he found Titus. So when Paul, upon hearing this word from Titus in Macedonia, he writes the book of 2 Corinthians. So in Acts chapter 20, if you go back to Acts chapter 20, in verse 1, <laughs> it says, we departed to go into Macedonia. So now we just read in the epistles why he did that. This is where the Acts and the epistles, they, they go like this. To understand the epistles, you have to go into Acts. To understand Acts, you have to sometimes do what we're doing tonight. And I know it's a little meticulous. This is kind of a study, but I hope it's of interest. So he departed to go into Mass. So in that verse, that's when he writes 2 Corinthians. So behind the scenes, Paul is writing the word of God. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. And by the way, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and this might help you understand these epistles better. To go, go to quickly, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. Real fast, Paul talks about the trouble that he had in Asia. And you tell me what incident is he talking about in these verses? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, where he says, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia. Where's Asia? What's in Asia? Ephesus. That we were pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raised the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. So he's talking about the trouble that he had in Asia. What incident is he talking about there? The riot. It was a near-death experience for Paul. So going back to Acts chapter 20, it says now, they went over those parts, that is, they went through Macedonia, and then he came down into Greece, and then about three months. So now, now he's in Corinth. Whoops. Now he's in, he's in Corinth. So he went through Macedonia, and now he's coming into Greece, and that's in, in Corinth. In Acts chapter 20, and verse number, uh, verse number 3. And it says, And abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, as he was about to sail from Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia. So what does Paul do at this moment? Go to Acts chapter 6, uh, go to Romans, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 16. What does Paul do in Acts chapter 20, verse 3? He writes the book of Romans. So he's written 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and now he writes Romans. He has three months, the three months in Corinth, is when he writes the book of Romans. And I believe Romans 16 and verses 1 and 2 give us a little clue about this. In Romans 16, verses 1 and 2. And I'm going to ask um, Debbie, do you have that verse? Could you read Romans 16, verses 1 and 2? Okay, so Paul says that they should receive this great servant, a woman, and the word is deacon. Some people get deaconesses from this verse, but she was a servant in the church named, and what was her name? I had Debbie read that verse, <laughs> Phoebe. <laughs> and Phoebe, he says, receive Phoebe. Now, where was she from? Where was she from? Do you know where that is? It's right next to Corinth. So Phoebe was from Sancria and probably a member of the church of Corinth. And Paul says, receive her. Now, why does Paul want the church of Rome to receive this great servant of the Lord? Receive her in the Lord. Many people believe that she was carrying the book of Romans with her. Paul entrusted the book of Romans with Phoebe. What a task. Can you imagine having the book of Romans the only copy of it in the world in your hand? 
And some people believe, I do believe, that it was Phoebe who had the word of God and brought it to the church from, from Corinth where Paul wrote the book of Romans. So this is what Paul is doing. He's writing the word of God as Phoebe from Corinth carries it into Rome. Okay, he's encouraging God's people. I'm going to skip over this pretty fast, but going back to, going back to Acts chapter 20, it says that he's encouraging. Paul was an encourager, like the captain of a ship. He's always embracing people. As it says, he embraced the disciples in verse 1 before he left Ephesus. And then in verse 2, it says, when he came into Greece and into uh, uh, Macedonia, with, he used much exhortation. So nothing is really said of that, those exhortations, but there was preaching, there was encouragement, they were in homes, they were on the streets, they were building people up in the faith, they were beseeching souls. You know that word? You know what that word, where that word is used with much exhortation? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body, what? A living. So he's beseeching them to present their lives to Jesus Christ, to surrender themselves, to believe on Jesus Christ, exhorting them, Acts chapter 14, exhorting people to continue in the faith. Continue, exhorting, beseeching. That's what he's doing. Number three, he's enduring still dangerous times because... It says here in verse 3 also that while he was in Corinth, the Jews laid wait for him. Now remember, Jewish leaders of the synagogue had been saved in Corinth. And Sosthenes, who had brought Paul before Gallio, before the, the judgment seat in Corinth, Sosthenes wanted Paul beat up. But when Paul later writes the church of Corinth, he writes with Sosthenes. So the chief ruler, Sosthenes, and there was another chief ruler who was saved in Corinth. And so the Jew, Jewish people were hot at Paul. So Paul shows up again, and they have a plot to kill him. Now Paul was planning to go to Syria. Watch what it says here. It says, he, at, right as he was about to sail to Syria, the plot was uncovered, so he purposed instead... To return through, well, you know the map by now. You got it memorized. He was just going to go from here all the way back to Syria over here to Antioch. But instead, he goes back through Macedonia. But you know what? Paul loved those churches in Macedonia. Of all the churches he started, they gave him least problem. I think the churches, of the, they, were, they were a giving, joyful group of people. And so Paul was like, I'm going to go to Macedonia. I, I think he was refreshed by the Macedonians. So he endured the plot. and he So he had to change his plans in order to spare his life. Sometimes your plans don't work out. And a lot of Paul's traveling plans did not work out just the way he had thought. So when your plans don't work out, trust God. And Paul was not being weak or uh, he didn't lack courage by saying you know what there's a plot to kill my life i'm going to get out of here if you know there's a plot to kill your life get out of there wipe the dust you know wipe the dust off your feet and leave that's what jesus taught the disciples it's not lacking courage to flee a situation where your life is in danger sometimes you have to flee peril and that's what paul does just when, like when he was let down by a basket that time. So Paul avoided danger. And then the, the other thing what Paul is doing here is, is he's giving to God's people. So again, as, as we look at this map, and, and you think about the book of, of Corinthians, and I've talked a little bit about it. So Paul's over here, and then he writes the book of 1 Corinthians, and the Corinthians had kind of promised that they were going to give him money, but then they didn't pay up. So in 2 Corinthians, there's two chapters, and they're all about grace giving and about, remember what he said? He said, because he, he wrote Corinthians from Macedonia, and the Macedonians had given so generously to him, and he says, and he used them as an example to the Corinthians to give as well for this special offering. So throughout this whole thing, Paul has been collecting money for the saints, and that's why I believe these different individuals are also referenced who were accompanying Paul 
and they're from different areas, and so they had accountability with the finances. And also another thing that's going on here that's, that's kind of interesting is that Paul, when he left here, like I said, he went through Macedonia, but these others did take a ship and they went over to Troas to meet Paul there in Troas. So they didn't all travel together all the time. Paul had to get out of there quickly because of this plot on his life. And that's what it says in verse 5. These going before us tarried for us at Troas. Little, no detail, right? So, so then Paul says, we sailed away from Philippi. So they went up into Macedonia and then sailed from Philippi and then came down to Troas. And we were there for seven days. Now, the last thing here, and I, I, I don't have a, a lot of time on this, but this is so amazing to see an ancient worship service. So here's an ancient worship service. And the key ingredients of the ancient worship service, we still do today. Because the ancient worship, look at, look at the verse 7. Here it is. Upon the first day of the week they met. What day is that? That would be Sunday. When the disciples came together to break bread, they had the Lord's Supper. Now, they probably did it every Sunday. There are some churches. Who, who, what church does the Lord's Brethren Church, right? Do they do the Lord's Supper? Anyway, there's some churches that do that. We do it once a month. I know some churches that do it once a year. It says as often as you do it. I don't believe there's any command to do it like every day or once a week or once a month. But as often as you do it, do it in remembrance. I think the reason why most Baptists do it once a month is, is because probably we feel like if we did it every week, it would just become like a tradition and it would become more ritualistic and we could more easily just go through the motions of it. So I think once a month makes it so that it's a special time to do it once a month so that we don't just like just go through the motions and that it loses its its meaning to, for us. I've heard some people do it once a year. To me, that seems like a little not not enough. <laughs> so, you know, I, I believe it's up to the local church, though, U ultimately, how often we take the Lord's Supper is up to us and to get the mind of the Lord on. Okay, so I'll just throw that out there. So the first day of the week, they do the Lord's Supper, and then they have preaching. Why? Well, that's one thing we know they did. They've had such a long sermon, it went till midnight. It got interrupted with a, with a death. You know, a guy fell out the window, they healed him, they got him back sitting up there, and Paul went back to preaching. They didn't even have to... They didn't even have to, he didn't have to go to the hospital. He's like, he's fine, everybody, he's just fine. They just slapped his on the face a little bit, woke him up. And he, he kept, he didn't fall asleep again. Now, I did read something online when I was, I always trying to find pictures like this, you know. And one person was like saying, he, he has the, the Eutychus falling asleep sermon. And, and so the first part of the sermon was Paul's wrong for preaching so long, you know, and that preachers shouldn't preach so long because it puts people to sleep. You know, you preachers, you just preach too long, you know. And so come on now, don't don't give your people so much, so, so such long sermons that you put them out like lights. So that was, and then it was like, no, then it was the Eutychus was wrong sermon, you know, <laughs> like he, he should have stayed awake. You know, it's the word of God. You should, you know, so you, you could take your pick. I personally think he was a young man. He was about 8 to 14 years old. If I preached all night, do, do you think Timmy would fall asleep? Uh, and I wouldn't think you were wrong for falling asleep if I preached at 4 in the morning. I'd fall asleep too, <laughs> right here in the pulpit. So, but let me just, let's look up a couple of verses before we close tonight about why we meet on Sunday. It's a big question that people have and not the Sabbath day. So let me ask you to, uh, Tim, could you get Galatians chapter 3, verse 19? And Anna Faith, could you get Galatians chapter 4, uh, verse 10? And then, Kristen, you could read verse 11. Okay. Galatians chapter 4. So you guys got that over there. And then I'd like for us to read Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. And I'm going to ask Sister Esther Hahn. Could you read for us? And we're going to start with that one. So if you go to Colossians chapter 2, 
and verse 16 and 17. And here's some verses on why we don't keep the Sabbath day. And there is a lot of different angles we could go at to, to teach this. But just for simplicity, just look at these verses here tonight. Colossians chapter 2, 16 and 17. Dr. Hahn? Okay, so he says, whatever day you worship, don't let anyone judge you. We have freedom in Christ because we are free from the law. And Romans 6, 7, and 8 teaches that we are delivered from the law and we are under the higher law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And notice what he says, in respect to a holy day, those were the annual feasts like Passover, the Day of Atonement, the Jewish feasts that they celebrate once a year. And then he says, the new moons, what were those? Those were the monthly feasts that the Jewish people had. When the new moon changed every month, they would have a particular feast. And then he says, and of the Sabbath, what's the Sabbath? The weekly feast. So the Jewish people, they had feasts. They, they, they had celebration, good idea. They had annual celebrations, monthly celebration, and every week is a celebration. It's called the Sabbath day of rest. But don't let anybody judge you in keeping of those things now that we are in Jesus Christ. Because he said, come unto me, Jesus said, come unto me and I will give you rest. The Sabbath is a picture of our rest that we have in Jesus Christ. That's what he means when he says those things are just a shadow. But the substance is Christ. We have the truth of rest, the real rest in Jesus Christ. Because we rest 24-7. We're like 7-Eleven when it comes to rest. The lights never go out and we're always at rest in Jesus. Okay, Galatians. Go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. And Tim, could you please uh, read that verse for us? Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. Wherefore then serveth law, it was added because of transgressions, till the seed should, be, should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. And if you read the whole passage, what does he say there? He said the law was going to be in force until what? Until who? Until who? Until the seed comes. Who's that seed? Jesus Christ. So Paul tells us that the law, right there, and you can read, is the schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. And once the schoolmaster has come, once the seed of the woman has come, who will crush the serpent's head, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. So the law was never meant to be permanent. It was always a temporary fence around the people of God. So the seed could come. And that's where he says in verse 25, but after that faith has come, that is faith has come in Christ. He's talking about Christ being justified by faith. We are no longer under a schoolmaster, the schoolmaster being the law. Okay, now Galatians chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. Those will be the last verses. So, Anna Faith, could you read verse 10, please? Galatians chapter 4, verse 10. Give your days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Yeah. So, he had labored with them to show them that through the grace of Jesus Christ, we're no longer under the law. But now, they were going back to it through this sect that was arising these Jewish people who said, oh, we believe in Jesus, but we believe in the law. And they wanted to bring, uh, be to believe in Christ, what these Judaizers, they're, ca they're called Judaizers. They said, oh, yeah, we believe in Jesus, but we believe the way you come to Jesus is by keeping the law. You believe in Jesus by getting circumcised first. You believe in Jesus by keeping the Sabbath day and by keeping these different feasts. And so that's why Paul says, I have labored on you in vain if you go back to the observance of days, 
that's the Sabbath, of months, those are the new moons, and of years, those are the annual feasts. So he says it in a different way, but the same thing that he said in the book of Colossians. So this is what a little bit of what Paul is doing as he shows the care of the churches. He's worshiping God and teaching people the worship of God. And Paul did preach a long sermon, and I won't preach that much longer, only one minute. And I will just say this as I close. Imagine if you had one chance to hear Paul preach. And it would be the only chance you had. I would say, Paul, preach all night. Let's pray.